give a chance to those who would like to leave to go. We, uh, we and then we we'll have Q and A. And uh, Bonnie, would you like to come as well? We have a couple of mics in the audience, so if you have a question for Julia, just throw your hands in the air, and we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. But I'm going to start things off because we're coming up on, I guess, the first anniversary of the fire. So I'm curious to know what happened to all of these folk. What, 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 happened, to what happened to them? To these people? Yeah. Well, most of them left before the fire, as you could see. And Mucharata was the only one who stayed in the city. And she returned as soon as possible to the city. And she was, um, she was experiencing problems with her son. And she had to kind of uh, not stick at her job. And she was laid off not a long time ago. But she went to the mm -hmm. Philippines, and now, I didn't know, but she's now back. She was back in Fort McMurray. And she's working right now as a nanny. Oh. Yeah, I just yeah, learned about cycle. it. It's full cycle, yeah. I learned about it not a long time ago. It's uh, several days ago. We were showing the film in Fort McMurray, actually. Yeah. It was received fantastically. Yeah. Fantastically. So we were very happy about it. But the whole idea of the film was actually Bonnie Thompson's idea. It's not my idea, it's an big Bonnie Thompson. <laughs> I had no idea what Fort McMurray is, absolutely not. We kind of live here in our own bubble. They have their bubble. So only after I came there, I learned that a truck driver somewhere in the world can actually earn 250,000 from driving from point A to point B back and forth for 12 hours, about 300 meters, so 500 meters most. And it's a very difficult job because it's so tiring, because nothing happens there. <laughs> so uh, the real threat right now is because of the changes in the price of oil that the companies will actually start automatization, because this is an easier thing to be a, uh, operated by a computer and the, the truck. And then in that case, all these guys and gals, but most of the guys will not be able to make this money. And the city has changed a lot. There's much less people right now. It's maybe one fifth. That's how it feels. And Julie, you have quite a sort of innovative way of finding the characters that you chose to follow in your film. It's just because I'm very logical. And the logic says <laughs> we are making a film in Fort McMurray. And uh, most of the population is male, uh, under 30. And I am a female, over 45. <laughs> so I need to make some adjustments. <laughs> so I stay female, but I must be much younger. The only way to be younger is online, right? So I created two fake profiles on plants of fish. <laughs> Just because I'm logical, there is no other reason. So one profile was um, a lovely, absolutely lovely Polish nanny. And she had long hair. My characters have to have to be uh, second language, because I'm second language, so I went and writing it should be second language. And she was extremely popular. Uh, this fantasy of Polish nanny, it was fantastic. And the other one, the other one was, uh, she was about 30, she had uh, short hair. The photo was the coolest photo I can find online, made by a very famous photographer in Russia. And she was sophisticated, she was quirky, she wasn't popular, no. She wasn't. Uh, so, Mar uh, actually, Max contacted me uh, through Plenty of Fish in a very innocent way because he is a, uh, he's an artist. He wrote to this Polish girl that, I want to cut your hair. Aww. And the Polish girl wrote back that, uh, I'm very sorry, I'm not a Polish uh, girl who is 26, but I'm a filmmaker over 45, and I am making a film, and uh, you are, you look fantastic. And when I heard that, he, when I understood that he is a barber, that was uh, the biggest draw, because as a filmmaker, then you can bring your subjects to him, and it will look as if it's just someone stopped by, but actually those are people whom you bring. So, and his response was, forget about uh, the girl, I want to be a star. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, that was Max, and uh, I found also the, um, the scriptwriter from Hollywood online, I wrote to him, he didn't write to me. 
I wrote to him because that's what I was doing. I was surfing and checking who is interesting uh, there. My goal was to find people who just arrived and those who had bigger dreams, not just to uh, make money for the sake of making money. So I, I like that your people being also on the margins of this uh, boom because uh, they are kind of there, but they cannot catch this um, this bird, golden bird, by its tail. Do you have any questions for Julia? Just throw your hand in the air and we'll get the mic to you. Quite thinkable. <laughs> okay, thanks. Just the, uh, the reference for the crows uh, mm -hmm. that appear so often, <clears throat> where did the idea come from and what was that uh, representing? Um, mm -hmm. Especially crows on the uh, snow pile uh, or ravens, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On, on the snow pile. Yeah, pile. in the middle of it. So. Uh, well, ravens is First Nations. Definitely when you come as an immigrant to this land, eventually you get drawn into the um, tales and art of the First Nations. You feel it uh, in, in Vancouver, uh, for sure. So when I went there and I saw these ravens, they're huge, they're very magnificent birds. And I was uh, filming one day on the um, garbage, uh, no. yes. Uh, so, uh, and uh, they started to fly above me because they were very interested who I am. And they didn't uh, think that I, have a, I had a big camera, but they knew it wasn't uh, uh, a weapon. They understood it. And they were interested and they were flying. And the sky was white. And I started to film them. I didn't know what I will do with it, but I filmed them for a year, uh, for an hour and a half. And the guy who was driving me, he thought I'm completely crazy because mm -hmm. we actually were going to the site. We wanted to film site, and instead I filmed this ravens. So, uh, because it was white sky, it's easy to juxtapose with any image. So that's what I did. But uh, in uh, the First Nations um, culture, raven is. Uh, First of all, he he knows more than we do, right? And uh, he's a trickster. And he, for me, he he lives longer, so he can wait till we all uh, disappear in, in, in some way. So that's why it's a raven. And the longer we watch the film, the more ravens are flying because they're watching us. For me, it was important that someone is watching watching our small dreams and how hard we want them and what we're actually doing in order to achieve them. And uh, that's why the ratings. Another question here? First, I'd like to thank you for a marvelous project. It was absolutely mesmerizing, really well done. You could have done many different ways, and you chose just the right way to keep us completely transfigured with the story. My question is around the very wealthy. Did you on purpose not get them in there? They're very wealthy. Um, you know, they are there. They're just not main characters. Like they are there. Like Mucharat is actually quite wealthy. She makes two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand a year. Maybe three hundred. I'm exaggerating. So two two fifty. Um, so, and the young guys who we see, they also make a lot of money. So we see them. They're just not characters. Um, I was following uh, those who just arrived. I wanted to see how they succeed. And uh, also, I was following artists. So they just were unable to um, convince themselves. And if you don't uh, have the ability to convince yourself, you can't convince others either that you're one of them. right? And this uh, issue of being one of them uh, it's something that is uh, common for any immigrant, for me as well, in the community that I work in, in the filmmakers' community. Uh, am I the member of this community, or am I also on the margins of this community? I, sometimes I feel I, I am. So, um, uh, socially, I mean socially. So, uh, these the people whom we see, uh, they're from different countries. And for me it was very important that one is from the Middle East, one is from Africa, one is Asian. So I kind of cover the world of uh, immigrants. So they just didn't become, the guys didn't become wealthy. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question up here.
you just mentioned uh, the, uh, the, the people that uh, you talked to and the number of countries they were from. When I was watching this, I was wondering if there's something specifically Canadian about this, or could you see similarities between this documentary about this resource town and the decline and fall in northern Alberta, and perhaps uh, the decline and fall of a resource town in another country? Were there any similarities, any differences that came to mind? Um, I felt that this city is a, a metaphor that this is a fable, that it could happen anywhere, that Fort McMurray has just happened to be Fort McMurray in Canada, but I think it can happen absolutely anywhere, including Vancouver, if some of the tankers uh, just have the leak uh, in, uh, in the space between North Vancouver and Cold Harbor. So all our uh, real estate prices with the same speed will go down and it will be the end of our bubble. So, uh, in a way, uh, I fully appreciate your question because uh, I was trying to make it as an example. Um, in this film, we have Canadians the way I see them. Um, and because they, uh, this uh, group of people are young, I think that that's how Canada will look uh, in, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 years that we have this wonderful girl, Sable, with a strong Canadian-born, uh, very positive example. We have a fantastic guy from Newfoundland who is altruistic uh, um, as well. And we have Patrick who is American. And then we have people from all over the world who live here and who come here. So that's why it's like that. Julia, I really appreciated your film. I thought the characters was so interesting. Um, I know that Fort McMurray changes people when they get there. It seemed that's what I saw. Um, I want to know, as a filmmaker, how did it impact you spending so much time there? Did it change you? Oh, that's a very serious question. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, of course, any project changes you. This was a difficult project for me and a difficult project for Bonnie because uh, we were in the same boat as these people. We were, we were thrown into production, post-production, out of production, another production, and Bonnie was finding money to again open the project. So it was a difficult project, so it was a long project, so you go there all the time. And uh, it was my first experience of making a film about working class Canadians. So my interaction with people uh, in Fort McMurray, um, in the church, and in many other places was pretty positive. I didn't interact that much with the baseball wearing 30 years old. Uh, I mean, other people who have children who live there, who, who call this place home. So my impression of working class Canadians was uh, very, very, very positive. Uh, I found lots of stamina and kindness in them. So it opened uh, my eyes to, to certain positive things. Because we live here in Canada, and of course, well, in Vancouver, we socialize uh, like with people we know. So not often expo being exposed to other people. And um, of course, seeing the oil sands. Uh, seeing the oil sands is this uh, pace of development that was uh, beyond comprehension. You feel that something can happen, and you think how other people don't feel it that way like other powers. And right now, for example, we have elections, and it's all about immediate money, immediate money, and even the conversation about child care, $12 a day, we cannot afford it because it's not, uh, it will jeopardize our financial situation here. But in 20 years, this uh, inability to think about the future bites us back. So uh, definitely that's a place where I felt that the inability to think about the future might bite us back. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Can I have question up here? Yeah. Yeah. Next one, okay. okay. Really, really love the film. Uh, thanks uh, for that. Um, uh, wondering how, if you ever dealt directly with the oil companies and uh, or how you got your your footage of sight. <laughs> Do you want to answer? No, you don't. Well, 
Uh, my answer would be, we tried. Yes, we tried. We tried. Uh, the idea initially that we both loved was the film about strong Canadian women working on site. And uh, we just tried to contact different uh, companies. We went, we went, we were allowed to go and see campsites. It was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. But there was no chance to get any permission from them. And then we had a um, situation with Mucharata because I filmed her on site. I had her going up this huge truck. And it was very innocent, show, innocent shots. And the companies just didn't even want to consider any offers that Bonnie was giving them. Like, so they could even veto the shots. They could do anything, but they didn't want uh, it to be in the film. So uh, the visuals that we have were purchased uh, from another company, a White Pine? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, Off-site, I mean, when they're driving. Yeah. Right? And then we have also here, uh, I'm very grateful to David Lavalier, who was making very serious environmental films, and he was kind enough to allow me to use some of the footage that uh, I begged for. But he was uh, very, very generous and supportive. So thank you, David. And there's a question up here. Ah, there was this question up there. Oh, yes. Sorry, we don't oh, have I mean, mics up here. Oh, we're oh. Irish. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Julia, you, you talked about how felt Fort McMurray influenced you, but as I've seen many of your films, and you're just like the filmmaker there with these people for over a year, right? Uh, over three. Three oh. years. Uh, four. But uh, you must have oh. influenced them just to uh, the kids and saying, do you have a dream? Well, you know, the, it's, it's a very good question. I, I tried so hard to influence Max. I tried so hard because I could see that he's a very talented artist. But this rejection of artistry in, in him was, um, was very difficult to accept because it is something that you grew up with in the family, that it wasn't uh, encouraged, it wasn't appreciated. Uh, so. Uh, I was surprised that I couldn't influence him uh, basically at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, but they all needed support. So when they were in Fort McMurray, I influenced them by being in a way like their auntie or mom. Uh, for Max, he was at the age of my daughter. So I had this mother-son relationship with him that was important for him because he was very lonely. And also he could throw tantrums. Uh, and I would tolerate it as a mother, right? Uh, he couldn't do it for any of the women he was dating because, you know. But, uh, so, and um, with King Deng, I continue to support him because I think that it is a very difficult path for him and uh, he is a very, very talented, talented musician. So uh, basically when I was coming there, it was time that then when they were not lonely in front of Let's put it that way. I think we have time for one final question for Julia. Right here. Um, Julia, what's amazing, it's a pretty gritty subject in the place and uh, the whole thing, what's going on there. And yet, you made such a poetry out of it. Oh, thank you so yes. much. <laughs> and well, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the other thing that impressed me almost from the first shots, the music, how you, mm -hmm. almost everyone is singing. Mm -hmm. With that greedy background, uh, uh, and all along, you use the music background again, it adds the poetry. It's so well kind of, uh, of mm -hmm. synchronized together, merged together. It's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Thank you so much. About the music, I wanted to say that I always make films with music that pre exists. And some of the music here, the one that doesn't have King Tang Sing, is local uh, Vancouver musician who couldn't be here today because he is touring. But I heard him on Burnaby Mountain just performing at one of the events, and I really liked his 
music and therefore she um, uh, sing. Yes, I'm back with uh, with names. Uh, uh, his name is Rup. Uh, so if you if you check him out, and um, also the music came uh, from my friends in Montreal, the classical music over there in the film. And uh, yes, everybody was singing. Actually, in fact, everybody was singing. I didn't include some of them. Sable also sings, and Patrick sings uh, not that great, but he does. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Max doesn't sing, doesn't sing. No, but, he, but he sang there a little bit. Yes, yeah. yeah, so when he smoked, right? When he smoked, he is up there. <laughs> yeah. And yes, he should have been an actor. He has a. He has. He had lots of beauty when he was 23, especially. He was very beautiful, beautiful boy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Thank you for this last comment about poetry. For me, it was very important. Um, being young and daring something in such a harsh northern city, where you go uh, with, with all your innocence. And uh, as Max says there, like he says something about you. Uh, when you're young and innocent, that's when you dream. So I felt that they deserve lots of poetry. And the place, actually, is incredibly beautiful. It's a strange place. But the natural beauty there is uh, the, the sky, the sunset, uh, is pretty, uh, pretty amazing. So I, I'm drawn, uh, in terms of energy, I'm drawn to this place. I always want to go back there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're going to have to get wrapped up. Please give a great. Thank you so much.